I'm hoping we're on. Thumbs up, Etienne. Okay. Um, my name is Martha Rentfro, and um, I'm, I guess, by default, the director of um, Lost Skills uh, program that we just started last month. And um, it's good to see some people back um, from that. And um, tonight, uh, we're excited to present Lost Skills again. And first of all, I want to remind you what Lost Skills is. And um, it, first of all, we're sponsored by the Edwardsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, second, is this not working? Do I need to turn it on? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the purpose of Lost Skills program series is um, to help people gain skills that will make them more independent of, uh, of the convenient shopping that we're all so used to and the services that people um, provide that we depend on. And th these are things that we can do ourselves but we have to learn them for some people. Also, it can save money, and um, it can bring families together. A lot of these skills can. Um, because collectively, they're meeting the needs of their household. And it brings opportunity for us to teach our children these skills also. It can also improve health. And... Uh, in many ways, one getting exercise, and another is is just um, eating better and things like that. So, as some of our potential future topics, we're doing our gardening this month and next month. And um, as we go along, every so often there will be a garden um, program because we can't teach you everything that we have learned about gardening because we've learned it over quite a few years. But um, we can start out, for those of you who haven't had a garden yet. Um, herb growing and some of their uses, foraging, that will be in um, June. And food preservation we'll be doing in July with canning and um, dehydrating. <coughs> Uh, meal planning is something we're thinking about in the future. Bread making will be in May. And uh, cooking from scratch is another future project. Um, survival skills will be in August. Uh, car maintenance 101, we're hoping for September. And uh, heat sources and firewood in the future sometime. So um, we will be adding to that list, I'm sure. So today, uh, we're going to be doing Garden for Sustainability. And I have the privilege of having Melody here to help us out. Um, she'll be doing some presentation near the end. <clears throat> I'm Martha Rentfro, and um, I love gardening. And I grew up gardening. <laughs> Um, when we were real little, I don't think we did a whole lot as much. My dad, we lived in Puerto Rico, and my dad had to learn tropical gardening. But um, then when we were in high school and college, that was part of how we got through school, was one, canning, and, er, gardening and canning and preserving for our own family, and two, truck gardening. And I remember planting 4,000 tomatoes and picking them all afterwards and, and 300 cantaloupe and things like that. So uh, we grew up. And then um, as an adult, you know, with my own family, um, I've done lots of different gardening, uh, in-ground gardening, you know, where you till it and everything. But it, then over the years, I've learned that I like the no-dig gardening better. Um, I've even done the square foot gardening where uh, I had a four by 12 um, 
garden and every square foot was a different thing, you know, a couple tomatoes, a couple peppers and some radishes and, you know, all different things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about square foot in a little bit. And then <clears throat> I've done um, back to Eden gardening, and which it, you layer... Um, um, dirt or compost, not just dirt, uh, we use leaf mulch, and then you layer uh, wood chips on top of it uh, to help um, with moisture preservation and things like that. And so we just learned a lot of things like that, and now I, I do a modified <laughs> um, form of some of those things. So um, that's my experience in gardening, and I would like Melody, do we have a mic for her? Um, I'd like Melody to introduce herself and uh, tell you just a little bit about her experience with gardening. Hi, I see a lot of people I know. Hold it up. Um, okay, um, so those of you who know me know that I also am crazy about gardening. I love it, <laughs> and I've been playing around with orcharding too. <laughs> And like Martha, I um, had a journey of, I started with containers and tomatoes. And we live in a forest, and so we didn't have a lot of sunlight. And so you get creative and you use trellising and things like that. We eventually pushed back the woods a little bit, and then I could really go crazy. <laughs> so um, I went through a several different kinds of gardening ideas, um, at similar, um, but I also did mitt lighter. And um, I did some raised beds, but I ended up d realizing that in the ground was actually probably, for me, it was more practical, easier to manage and maintain. And then I ended up, you know, we, 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 gra we take little bits of this and that, whatever works best, and we just, you know, and of course nowadays with the internet, it's really cool because, you know, we've got a lot of really smart gardeners out there, and they're all pool pooling their information and um, you, you, you pick and choose what sounds right mm -hmm. for you and your situation, and then you try things, and there's been a few times I went online and I said, you know, I think I've got a good idea, but let me check before I put expense into it and see if anybody else has done it. And oftentimes, somebody has, and there've been a few times I've decided I'm not gonna do that because, oh, oh, that can get into it, and that can go wrong, mm -hmm. so. So anyway, long story short, I'm, I've come to the conclusion for me, too, that I like, the no-till method really mm -hmm. well, and the Back to Eden, uh, I've modified that a little because in this area, um, we have more moisture than they have out there. And so you have to do it more frequently because it, it composts down with more moisture. The mm -hmm. wood chips, the aged wood chips, compost down to dirt much more quickly. And so um, also, weeds can happen more quickly because it's not as dry. So, mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, it's soft. You know, it creates softness below it, um, and so the weeds are easy to pull when, when they do come. Mm -hmm. And then you, do, you have to refresh it about every, you know, year or so, like mm -hmm. in the fall, a couple of inches. But it, between that and adding landscape cloth periodically. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I am, and I'm, you know, you experiment every year. It's fun. It's like a <laughs> kind of a game. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so, and I've been doing it for more than 10 years or so. So, mm -hmm. you know, learning every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So um, we are live streaming this, and we are also taping it. Um, so we want to make sure questions we're going to take afterwards. Uh, each of you have been given a little 3x5 card, and you can write it down. Uh, any questions you have, and then we will answer them afterwards. Um, okay, so why would you grow your own food to and or start your own seeds? And um, one of the things is nutrition and knowledge of what is in your food. Um, also, it tastes much better. And you know what, you're, what kind of soil you're using and all that kind of stuff. Um, it is more cost effective. You also get exercise, sunlight, and fresh air. And that all helps with, um, with good health. So 
Also, uh, it gives a sense of accomplishment. Oh, at the end of a good day, a you know, long day, or those plants look so beautiful. Um, I have to say, I have some over here that I've been growing, and we're going to be giving those away too. And that's a sense of accomplishment. It really is. Um, also, you're learning, learning about gardening and all these different things, trying to figure out what's going to work for you and things like that is really good brain exercise. And there's so much to learn from nature. It is so important to see all the things that God has created and watch those little seeds come up and everything. And I'm sorry, I got started on this. I need to have a prayer. I like to have a prayer before um, because I need God to be talking through me <laughs> because, um, okay. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the things you've created, for the garden, for the uh, things around us in nature, the, even all the little microbes and everything that grows is underneath the soil. It is all for our benefit. And I just pray that you will help us to learn uh, more about it and um, bless me as I talk that it will be clear for those who are listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, when you're trying to plan a garden, there are a couple questions that you need to ask. Um, what are you doing the garden for? Are you going to want just seasonal eating? There have been times that I just wanted tomatoes or uh, green peppers or cucumbers or whatever just for the season um, because I didn't have time or lived somewhere where I couldn't do it or whatever. But then there are other times that I have been uh, growing for preservation. You know, um, many years I would just preserve tomatoes, uh, just the basics, you know, just some tomatoes, some, um, what else did I do? Uh, a little bit of fruit here and there and things like that, or green beans. Um, but then right now, my husband and I are on a journey where I'm retired now, and my goal is to preserve as much of our own food as possible. And the basement is my grocery store. So, um, you know, there's different goals that you have. Um, is it for your family or are you planning on sharing? My dad taught me a lot about gardening. And one of the things he taught me was giving food away. <laughs> <laughs> just always sharing, sharing food, and um, that's really important to me. Um, how much support will you have? Will gardening and preserving be up to you alone? Um, over the last few years, it started to be more me alone, and so I have to be thinking of that. Um, sometimes you have friends who, who will help, that's wonderful. I love when people want to help because I can teach them and also I love to share the food. Um, but you also have to make sure that you don't anticipate more help than they can give, you know. So it's that balance, you know. What, um, what are you going to do? How much support you have? I do have to say, my husband, he has a hard time, you know, helping with a lot of it. But boy, he sure enjoys the fruits of it. <laughs> okay. Also, how much space do you have? Um, and when you think about space, you also, I just put this in because I hadn't put it in before, about how many hours of sunlight. And I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that would be under our space-wise. Six to eight hours of sunlight is considered full sun by some, some say eight to ten hours of sunlight, um, a, a full sun. Uh, that's not 
you know, you don't have trees around, and yeah, Melody, I'm I'm opposite of you. I have wide open uh, space where it gets lots of sun all the time. Um, so container gardening. Uh, oh, uh, there's container gardening or raised bed gardening or in-ground gardening. And I did a little bit of trial with container gardening last year, and I'm going to be doing more. Uh, so we'll start with container gardening. This was, the, in the picture, it's called a green stock, and it's, it's uh, planters that are stacked up, you know, and there's a watering system in it, so you just pour the water in the, in the top, and it kind of filters down. Uh, sort of mixed bag. Some people have real good luck with it. It's not that I didn't like it. It's just something you have to get used to. Container gardening. Um, one thing is that you have to have decent soil. You would use a potting soil for that. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be the top of the line, but you want something that, you know, has mostly soil in it and not a lot of, some of them have more wood chips or some little pieces of wood in the potting soil. I have some potting soil here. You can see later, uh, potting soil sometimes has little um, chunks of, uh, stuff in it, whether peat or sometimes, like I said, it's wood, little pieces of wood um, in it. Um, also, you want to look at your choice of plants. Um, a long tomato that's going to, an indeterminate, an indeterminate tomato, which keeps growing and growing and growing, isn't going to it'll be harder to manage in one of these um, containers, you know. And tomatoes have a pretty big root. So I, I have seen some people put a little tomato in um, a green stock, but I have also seen uh, them put in a larger pot, you know, put tomatoes in a larger pot. Um, these do really well for lettuces, and I put some carrots in there, and um, I even had some broccoli in there, and it did fairly well, though it r grew pretty big. Um, <clears throat> there are also sometimes some dwarf varieties of different things that you can get, and those work really well in the, um, the green stock or any of your containers. Um, there are different sizes of containers. There are types of containers. Um, like I said, this is a green stock. You can have decorative containers. You can have plastic buckets. That's one thing I'm going to try to do this year is I've gotten a whole bunch of plastic buckets and a food grade, and I'm going to put holes in them, and I'm going to grow my um, zucchini and yellow squash in them. And in an area, I'm gonna, a large area where I'm going to put wood chips on the ground, you know, and then just have those containers. And um, I, like Melody said, there's a lot of people who've tried a lot of different things online. Um, I look, you find the things on YouTube, and once you, of course, start looking at some, they start keeping coming, you know. But um, I think that I'm going to have less problems with squash bugs and stuff for that, I'm hoping. Um, also, uh, plastic buckets and, uh, okay, and then grow bags. And I'm afraid that I think that, uh, I have a grow bag, I think it got left in the car. Um, but grow bags are kind of a pellon, not more, a real heavy pellon or something like that, that um, they will let, Laurel, it's in the, in the trunk, I think. Um, and the, the button is, do you know where the button is? Okay. <laughs> um, the grow bags are, um, they get air, they allow air to come in. And so when your plants are growing in the grow bag, 
uh, a lot of times if you're, they're growing in a regular pot and they, the roots get real long and stuff, they start going in circles, you know. And in the grow bag, it allows air to get to the roots and it air prunes them. So it, they stop growing once they get to the edge and they kind of grow sideways, I guess, you know, branch out. Um, and so that works out uh, pretty good. I do like those. Um, and I've put my mint, if anybody knows mint, mint just grows like crazy. And I've put, yeah, thank you. This is a little bit dirty. I, what? Oh. <laughs> so this is a grow bag. And you can get them with handles on them. You can get them any size. You can get them 15 gallon, you know. I think this is probably five gallon. Um, and those work out really nice. Um, one thing about wa putting things in containers, you have to water them a whole lot more. <laughs> you have to, be, because, you know, it's a smaller amount. They don't get, they aren't always in a place where they can get rain or like the green stock. Um, the rain comes down like this, but doesn't quite get all the little areas in it. So you do have to water them quite a bit more. Here, Melody had some uh, pictures here. Um, this one here, it has a little reservoir on the bottom, and this is where you put your water in. And I think it has a cover on it too, didn't you say? Yeah, yeah, like if it was going to frost, it would get cold out at night. Yeah. If it, okay. And, yeah. Um, I'm going to give you this so that you can turn it on when you need to, okay? Um, so, yeah, this is to hold up the frost cover if you need that. Um, here's one that she did for her mother, too. And one thing I wanted to point out is here she used, used some of the um, woven uh, fabric um, ground cover so that you don't get all the weeds, and I didn't have another method, or I didn't have any pictures with that for myself. So that's one thing. If you have an area that you're trying to grow in and you don't want to deal with all the weeds, like Melody said, you can put um, wood chips on, and that can help a lot. But you, weeds can still come up in the wood chips, uh, especially as they're breaking down and everything, depending on wh what seeds get blown in or whatever. But um, this is, makes a really nice, clean garden. And um, if you ever go out to the garden out here on the other side of the parking lot, they, they use a lot of this out there. The food pantry is helping with that garden. Okay, um, raised bed gardening. There's all kinds of ways that you can do raised bed. Uh, there are commercial um, galvanized steel ones. They're really nice. You can configure them in um, any way you would like. There are wooden ones you can get pre-done or you can cut your own wood to do them. Composite material, um, also cement blocks. I think I have that in here twice. Um, you can build your own with uh, pallets and you'll see one in the next picture that I built with pallets. Um, and then, um, the, of course, the galvanized metal and um, two by two two by fours I've seen people uh, online you know who have shown how they did how they made these really nice beds with uh, the galvanized metal and two by fours or four by fours you know for the corners and things like that um, also, some people have used uh, fencing modules or at least the the picket fences you know the what, six inch ones or uh, six or eight inch ones. And um, they use those. Apparently that may be a little bit cheaper than some of the other wood, but I have not priced it. So um, 
Also, you want your bed to be, it can be anywhere from eight inches, like a cement block, uh, to waist high. If it, some people have built them waist high. Uh, I personally have gone, the uh, tallest I've gone is about 18 inches. Um, how do you fill it? If it's just, you know, eight inches of cement block, then of course you're going to be we use leaf mulch. Um, it, we get it from South Bend Resources. Um, and for a pickup load, if you have a pickup, you drive it in there, and they'll take a front-end loader and dump a yard of <laughs> soil in your thing, and off you go for $4. $4. Um, We've done that a long time. We did that with our Back to Eden garden and now with this garden. And um, then, uh, or if you have a deeper, um, you don't want to put regular dirt in this because your regular dirt, a lot of them will compact uh, really heavy, you know. Um, at least that's my experience, you know. Um, but you can um, also, if it's deeper, you can put all kinds of things like um, tree limbs or, you know, leaves or um, grass clippings, anything to just fill the volume. And as you go along, that stuff's going to break down and it's really going to help feed your soil there too. And then the last little part you put is, is the leaf mulch, the dirt. Um, and then you can use a uh, square foot spacing in these raised bed garden beds. Um, square foot spacing, and I'm sorry, I couldn't find my thing <laughs> this morning, but, um, there's a little template here that shows, um, like you would... It's it's basically like they would do square foot gardening, and I have. If anybody wants to look at the square foot gardening book, I have that here. But um, with with uh, putting your um, your plants closer together, you want to make sure that your soil is well fed. So you'll use some compost and and things like that. Um, or some amendments, sometimes uh, some organic fertilizers and things like that to try to make sure that your uh, soil is well fed. But you can, square foot spacing, it would be like you can put nine um, bean plants, green beans, in, in a square foot. You can put um, 16 carrots, uh, carrot seeds, or... Um, Different things like that. One pepper, one tomato, um, one cucumber, um, just stuff like that, you know. Kind of as lettuce, you could probably put four, I think, in a square foot. Um, but I tend to, in my garden, I tend to plant closer together like that. Maybe not quite that close sometimes, but I, I plant closer together because I really try to feed the soil well, and it gives me, um, I can plant a whole lot more that way. Um, okay, now here's some pictures. Um, the far one is the one that I built out of pallets, just took the pallets and took a, a circular saw and cut right next to the uh, four, two by four, you know, things that hold the pallet together. <laughs> and then, then I screwed them all. I used those things, uh, the two by fours, and put on the inside, and then I just, um, you know, screwed all the things together. And that was, if I showed you all the pictures... It, it was put, I think there were three different sections here, and then two on the end. So that was six, seven, eight, seven, eight sections. This was about a 13-foot bed. So um, that was fun to do. And um, this one here was on the inside here. I just put uh, two-by-fours 
along the, um, right over where I had um, compost, and there was compost here. I put more wood chips in around the edges to try to keep, it's hard to keep weeds out sometimes, but you have to just keep working at it and add more wood chips and stuff. But those were just two by fours. And uh, these were, I think, two by sixes on the outside of the big fence in there that I had a little bed of about two feet there. Um, here's one, Katie Bowers sent me these pictures. This is a neat little picture there, um, a keyhole. And it was done with the landscape bricks, you know. And that is a little um, cold frame type uh, where you can start some of your um, seeds in that. It just kind of keeps the frost off of it. Oh, here's more of her beds that she has there. And those were probably 10 inches high, I think, it looks like. Okay, so um, no dig gardening. Th this is more on top of the ground. I mean, it's not. This is what I did now because um, I, the cement block one that you saw earlier, that's how I started, and I thought I wanted to do my whole garden in that. But my ground kind of goes like this, and I was trying to be real fastidious about leveling each of the blocks and and you know it's and these are 40 foot beds and I have six of them wow. and I knew that I couldn't haul that many cement blocks <laughs> so I changed my mind I have one with the cement blocks and the others all I did was I took string and I um, measured you know 40 feet put some uh, spacers in between, and then one across here, the string, and the string continued that way. With this end opened, and this was my 16 yards of dirt that I hauled with my wheels of barrel, and I just took it through here. I covered the uh, ground with um, cardboard first, and then just emptied the wheelbarrow. And as I went, I just kind of leveled it off so that uh, from this string to this string, it was um, four feet, and it was leveled there. And then the size just kind of sloped down from there. So that has worked pretty well. We'll talk about this method a little bit later. And um, so if you're doing a large area, these uh, soft-sided beds have been working for me. Um, one thing you can look up online is Back to Eden uh, Gardening, or um, Charles Dowding also has a lot of um, no-dig methods um, on YouTube. Um, another thing that some people use in their beds um, to try to loosen the soil so you aren't digging is a broad fork. And I didn't get a picture of it. But it's a fork, some of them are about 30 inches wide because a lot of the market gardeners do 30-inch uh, beds. And so um, it has two handles on it. It has some tines that go down a little bit angled, uh, not a lot, but they just put it down like this and rock it back, and it just kind of loosens the soil a little bit. It's not like you're digging it in. It just kind of loosens underneath, and then they just go on and do the same. Um, and they usually do that in the new season. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is the Ruth Stout method with straw, and like I said, we'll talk about that more later. I have some other pictures. Um, In-ground gardening, these are Melody's garden. And, um, and this, I know, isn't rototilling, but some people, if they're just brand new starting a garden, some people will rototill an area and at first so to kind of break everything up. And then they will 
um, plant that year and, and put grass clippings on it or whatever, you know, just to kind of try to help um, feed the area. But then what they'll do is um, other seasons they won't till, but they will, um, you know, just break it up a little bit if they need to. But, you know, using some of the grass clippings, using amendments, um, chopped up um, leaves at the end of the season to cover your beds or things like that will help uh, feed the ground and then they will be able to do the no-till method after that. But the whole thing is you got to feed your soil. you got to make sure that it's um, getting the nutrients and, and building uh, like uh, building all the structures underneath the soil. Uh, I think I, I know I've heard this before, but Melody reminded me today that um, underneath the soil, there's so much going on. There's more going on down below the soil than up above. And, you know, you have all these microbes and, and um, fungi and other things working underneath the soil. And if you have some really good soil, you can uh, pick it up with your hand. You can crush it, and it'll kind of hold together a little bit, but it, yet it's uh, flaky. And um, also you can see these little mycelium, the little white... Um, threads almost like you know that are growing if you if you have a big uh, place where you've been putting all your leaves every year and you uncover it and you haven't done it in a long time you see a lot of stuff going on underneath there and so a lot of that is what's going on underneath your soil um so like i said you don't want to till too much um after the first time you till, if possible. Um, a lot of times with in-ground, um, you, you put more of them in, in rows. You, uh, your rows are a little bit more spaced apart. Um, in my um, four-foot rows, I uh, four-foot beds, I'll do two or three rows depending on the size of the plant, you know. And they're spaced closer together but you can do like melody does a little bit farther uh spaced farther apart for what for the, wheelbarrow. for the wheelbarrow yeah right right and mine i have the four foot beds but i have four feet in between the beds so that i can get the wheelbarrow in and out too um one thing that I didn't mention on the others, with container gardening, you're probably not going to have any weeds. With, in, uh, with raised bed gardening, you're going to have much fewer weeds. You know, not very much. But, you know, every time you go out there, you're going, oh, there's a weed, you know, <laughs> you pick it up. Um, with the uh, um, gardening, the no dig like I do, there could be a few more weeds, uh, sometimes with in-ground gardening, not the way she does it because she uses a lot of mulch. But if you're not using a lot of mulch, then you could get quite a few weeds, especially when you're digging it. When you're rototilling, you're really bringing up seeds from who knows how long ago. And now they say, oh, I got water, I got air, <laughs> I'm going to grow. <laughs> and um, then that makes it much more difficult. <clears throat> okay, um, here's another beautiful picture. I am very wanting to see your garden this year. <laughs> um, and by the way, Melody and I have known each other, what, three weeks or whatever, but we already have this thing, this garden thing. <laughs> okay. Um, now, seed starting is another thing we're going to be talking about. Uh, one thing, how are you going to, um, what are you going to plant? First of all, plant what your family will eat. 
it's so easy to say, ooh, that one looks good, and that one looks good, and especially when you're a beginner gardener. <laughs> and, you know, but really plant what your family will eat. Um, decide the amount of what to plant based on your goals. You know, are you just eating seasonally, or are you uh, wanting to preserve or give away, and things like that. Um, also... Um, this is one thing we want to talk about is um, doing uh, moistening, pre-moistening the seed starting mix. Do you want to come up and talk about that? I think um, Etienne, you got it wrong. Okay. So so, he does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> one thing that's important, I know it's really easy to get excited about putting the dirt in and then watering and, um, you know, then planting your seeds, uh, but it makes it a lot easier if you get some kind of a container. For me, I just did something simple like this, and these are a couple other ideas. I think this is like a cement kind of, you know, you can get these in oh. a hardware store. Yeah. <clears throat> if you want them, because I'll, I'll throw other things in when I'm doing my... Um, other things that are not seeds, you don't have to have anything with nutrition in it for the seeds. And I'll use that too. But this year I'm using this, and I like this really well. So you throw your seed starting mix in, and you put your water in, and you just mix it around, and you want to get it damp before you put it in the trays, because if you try to put it in the trays and then get it damp, that if you've ever tried that, that doesn't work very well. And, and you the can water have, sits on top. <laughs> yeah, it, it'll sit on top, and, and also there'll be little areas inside where it's probably dry. It's probably mm -hmm. not damp all the way through. And some people might wonder why their seeds aren't sprouting, and sometimes that could be it. So I always, I often will put a little warm water in too, because I think it goes in easier. And I think usually when I'm doing seeds, I'm doing um, heat loving seeds, um, like tomatoes and peppers. Obviously, it's not going to be super hot, but warm is nice, and they seem to like that. And then when you put the cover over them, to keep the moisture in, it'll kind of get nice and like a greenhouse, moist mm -hmm. inside too. And I'll, a little trick that I use too to keep them warm until they sprout is I'll put them on the top of my freezer. Oh, It's warm up there. That's nice. You just have to keep an eye on it because they'll sprout faster than you think mm -hmm. <laughs> up there. And I've, I've used seed starting uh, uh, heat mats, but it's been hard to keep the heat where it's you know, it, it, sometimes they get too hot. Yeah. So, but that is easy because on top of the freezer, it's a, a uniform temperature. That's a great idea. I haven't thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, yes, you, you want to pre-moisten the seeds. You, you want a seed starting mix that has a little bit of vermiculite in it. And this is hard to see, but uh, vermiculite is a mineral that is um, put under a lot of heat, and it kind of blossoms and, and um, makes it so that it, can, it helps um, keep moisture in your soil or in your uh, seed starting mix and stuff. Most of the seed starting mixes will have a little bit of vermiculite in it. Um, <clears throat> So um, I personally, I tried some miracle Grow potting soil one time, and it was very hot. <laughs> My daughter's, <laughs> she is laughing about it, because it was. I mean, it was burning the plants. Um, but um, others, I mean, a lot of people have used it, and it was fine. But I think I just got something that was pretty hot. Um, if you're using potting soil for something that, um, like if you're starting carrots or, what, or something like that, like I did in the um, green stock, you want to um, sift your soil because, some, like I said, some of the so potting soils have a lot of um, uh, little twigs or, you know, th uh, pieces of wood in it and stuff. And you want something fine for carrots because carrots, if they grow, 
um, if they come to anything, you've seen the carrots <laughs> kind of turn. Um, if, if they have any inhibition, then they will um, not be straight. Okay, um, now you, um, one of the things, I'm going to show you some of the, and Melody and I found out that we use the same kind of, of trays. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. You can, that's good. We use the same kind of trays from the same company, but you can get them from all kinds of places, Amazon, and, and there's all kinds of different places that have them. But these are really pretty heavy. Um, this one is, uh, has little holes in it. This is something I can put two of these in one of these um, containers. And this is for starting like my microgreens or uh, putting um, a lot of lettuce in there if I want to do, okay. And so you can put that in there. Um, you can also, I have these. You can start lots of different seeds in this. You know, I, I can put tomatoes in this. Um, but then I start the seeds, tomatoes and peppers. In fact, I have one over there. And um, I can get a lot of seeds in here. But then as they grow and get bigger, um, like over that in that one, uh, as they get bigger, then I'll have to pot them up into another pot like this or whatever, a little bit bigger. One of the things you want to, uh, you can get all kinds of stuff like this, but you don't have to go expensive. You can get, put things in solo cups and you have to make sure that you have a um, hole in the bottom of, of them for drainage. It doesn't have to be that big. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been experimenting. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody on YouTube had a really great idea. They put them all like this, and they went with a drill. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. But then you, you want to put them in a tray afterwards in just like any of these. You know, they have holes in them, but then you have the tray that holds water, uh, like, like this one. It doesn't have holes but it holds water and she's like, what she's doing there, all of her um, little plants in, in whatever containers you are, uh, you use, you put them in something that will hold water also. It, you can drain down, but then they can also water from the bottom. Yeah, so if you, put, you water about every three days, about that much in the bottom, it'll pluck it up. And then uh, about three days later, just make sure it's not getting mold on it. But that's a great cycle so that you can water them all at once. Right, it's right. Nice, nice lazy way to do it. And one of the things that I... Right. One thing I was going to mention... Not right now. Um, one of the things I was going to mention is that um, when I water... These things, oh, we'll be getting to it in a minute here, I guess. Let me not get ahead of myself. Um, okay, one of the things you have to realize is some seeds will germinate faster than others. So you want to make sure that, um, that it, it's easier if you put slow germinating things in one tray and faster germinating, it's not necessary, but it's easier. And faster germinating things in another tray. Um, you'll notice here, most of these things are faster germinating, although there's a few things that have germinated slowly. This one here, I think I started this almost four weeks ago. <laughs> They're pretty, most of them are pretty slow germinating. In fact, I have some lavender here that you're just barely able to see it just in the last day or so. And um, these others, the peppers, are pretty slow germination too. Um, and some of them are still popping up. Um, so the next thing, let's see, I went the wrong way. Uh, oh, let me t tell you this, uh, cool weather crops. One thing 
Uh, some plants really like cool weather, and those are things like your brassicas, like your kale and your collards and your broccoli and your cauliflower and all those things really like the cool weather. And you have the list there. Um, the top ones, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, collards, kale, and cabbage, usually you want to start indoors because it will give them a, a head start outdoors and and you can utilize the time of cool weather for them to really um come to um fruition or you know uh, get bigger and and then in ground uh, you can put lettuce you can do lettuce indoors or you can do it uh, start it indoors then take it out or you can uh, just do it in the ground um because it grows faster. Swiss chard and Asian greens, uh, you can plant in ground. Peas, beets, and turnips, all of those things um, do better if you do it um, in the ground, direct seeding in the ground. Onions, there's two ways of planting onions. You'll see in the grocery stores or the garden centers, you'll see the little onion thing sets. You can plant those. Now is a good time to plant those in the garden. That those will give you onions that you can use all summer. They won't store if you're wanting to store them for the winter. Uh, they don't store very well. They're smaller bulbs also. Um, but that's the way most of us grew up growing onions. And Melody and I both, I think about two years ago, two, three years ago, each one of us um, have realized that um, through YouTube, <laughs> um, that if you grow your own onions, and these are the onions that Melody, I didn't get as good of germination this year for my onions, um, but you, you just put a lot of onions in there, and then you... Um, kind of tease them out when you go to plant them. Can I say something about the onions? At the end, Melody's going to talk. Um, I found out that onions only, um, they, they only go about one or two years, the mm -hmm. seeds. So usually one year to get good, and then the second year might not get as many germinating. And then the other thing about onions, you know how they get top heavy and they'll fall over? And if they fall over and, it, and they break at the neck, and they, you know, they, then they're done. Mm -hmm. So one thing that they did say you can do is that you can cut them yes. at like four inches. So this I've cut several times already. Um, they were, you know, so I'd cut them because they would start to lean over. And then what's, what's nice about onions that I learned, too, is I am not do it today because I'm not ready to plant these. But when you open them up, they tend to, the, the roots are pretty strong and they tend to grow fairly straight and they're pretty easy to pull apart. They really are. And then this is a first year onion, but those bulbs is a two year onion. And that's why they don't do as well. Yeah. So um, this will also potentially make a bigger bulb. Mm -hmm. So this is from seed. Yeah. The seed um, for onion seed doesn't, doesn't store very well. Right. It goes about one year, two years is what they say. Mm -hmm. I'm trying for three. I'm putting it in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's always experimenting. Yeah, but I did that last year, too, and I just kept cutting it off until I was ready to plant them. And it was pretty easy planting them. You can even them out. do it once you've planted them. If they're getting too high and you're afraid they're going to break at the neck and you mm -hmm. want to try to nudge a little more size in the bulb, you can still cut them off a little bit. I saw one lady who cut hers once they got to about 12 inches high. She just cut them all off. And then she used those green onion parts and, yeah. you know, well. uh, dehydrated <laughs> them and, and ground them up for, like, onion powder. Mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. And uh, warm weather crops... Um, I didn't do a big long list of this, but tomatoes, peppers, herbs, eggplant, flowers for pollinators. Um, one, that's one thing you want to do. Where do potatoes fall? Cold or warm? Oh, cold. Cold weather. Yeah, uh, I had that on there, but I didn't, li I didn't get it. On your handout, it's on there. <laughs> it's on the handout. Potatoes, my... 
Uh, what? Can you go back to the warm weather? Yeah. Um, oh. Okay, potatoes, my dad always said, you plant them, plant potatoes and onions on Good Friday. That was one thing he always said. Now, some years it's a little more <laughs> sketchy than others, you know. But uh, potatoes, they're going to stay under the ground. They're not going to freeze, you know. And uh, when it gets warm enough, then they pop up. Yeah, they say at least two weeks before the freeze. I mean, I mean you can do it two weeks before the last, like it, for us it's May 15-ish. Yeah, yeah. So like it, you could potentially plant them because it takes about two weeks to get them once the, they come above ground, they're vulnerable to frost. Right, so you right. Can let them get started so underground. planting to, uh, potatoes uh, two weeks before the last frost. Technically, our last frost is May, May 15, um, or Mother's Day, or whatever. I have seen something that said May 4 this year. I don't know. <laughs> of course, we want to push that, right? <laughs> but be careful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to say, uh, flowers for pollinators. I'm, I'm going to plant alyssum and zinnias and things like that. A lot of flowers in my garden as much as possible um, for the pollinators, for the bees, you know, uh, to have something to draw them in. Then they will uh, pollinate my other things, my squash and cucumbers and things like that. Okay, um, seed starting trays. I basically went over this. Um, and also the heat mat. I wanted to show you. I like Melody Sing of the freezer. I hadn't thought of the freezer. I have one that I can use it on. This is a heat uh, mat that I have used. And yeah, it works, but um, also sometimes... The, it, it doesn't reach the whole tray and, and stuff like that. But all, all you do is just uh, put it under your tray and it gives more heat for your um, germinating of your um, things. Um, if you're use, reusing pots, and when, oh, maybe I didn't. Also, peat pots. Sometimes these little peat pots you get to plant things in, and they look so neat. One thing I find, they don't really disintegrate as well. I'm not real happy with them. They oh, they mold more, yeah. So I'm not real happy with those. But um, if you're reusing your pots or any of your trays, I like to clean them out really good. And um, I put them in a light Clorox solution. Um, I had one, I heard one guy say, I know you're going to get me on the Clorox stuff, but that does work. Just very light Clorox solution. That makes sure you don't have any diseases that you're taking year to year, you know, because some people have lost their, their whole tray of stuff because of some kind of disease that uh, was going on. Okay, um, boy, uh, we're almost done. Uh, well, with my part, <laughs> Melody will be talking. Uh, watering. One thing when you're uh, starting your tray here, um, and I shouldn't do it quite here. Uh, when you're starting your tray, sometimes you need to, um, when I start seeds, one of the things that you have these little tiny seeds that you're putting in on top of these things, and some of them you want to, um, oh, that's one thing I didn't really cover. I did cover, but I didn't go over. With seeds, um, look at your seed packet, look at your catalog for a lot of information. You have all this information in your handouts, okay? Um, the depth of planting depends on the size of the seed. Some of them are very tiny. And kind of the rule of thumb is two to three times the size of the seed is how deep you plant it. Um, but 
what they also say is when you're, after you have planted everything, if, if you just put a little bit, if it's a really tiny seed, maybe you just sprinkle a little bit of soil over the top of it. Um, and then you have to water it in. And I'm sorry, I'm moving everything because I want to demonstrate this. So you want to water it in. You know these little sprayers? Those are hard to use. <laughs> and to spray these things. And what you do is you just... I got this at Rural King for $6 two years ago. It's really nice and handy. Just a little bit of air pressure. And then you just water it like that. And it just makes it really easy to water. It waters it in really nice. Um, my rule of thumb is as long as I have some that haven't germinated, I will use this sometimes for that. And then as they're going along, I'll put some, of course, down and below. But I don't want to water too soon below sometimes because it can, because of the um, mildew and the, you know, the. So. I am, I just do a little bit of this, and then I might put a little bit down below and not water it as much below until when they are coming up. When they're coming up big like this, like this one here, I pretty much bottom water. And that would be, and I haven't watered it today. I won't water a lot because I don't want it. But you just, you know, I use about this much for this. And that'll last, like she said, two, three days, you know, depending. Um, but I just pour it into the um, bottom of it, and it makes it really fast and easy to water them. Um, and then lighting. I use shop lights. Um, I got mine, I, I try to make sure they're uh, 60,000 lumens at least. Uh, 6,000 6, lumens. Um, and mine are LEDs. They work fine. Um, I got them at Real King two years ago, $25 a shop light. This was probably in January or something like that. You, they were having a really good sale on them. And um, so just watch for those things. Um, you might have seen, let me see. Uh, in this picture here, you can see I have one of these wire racks, and I have that near a window, but I still have the lights on it, you know. And I have several racks that I can use, um, about four of them, really, that I can use with lights on them. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, lighting... Um, a shelf unit is helpful, but use what you have. Figure out whatever you have, whatever lighting. One time we used these um, lights that you clamp onto something, you know. Just come up with something that you can use to give them more light. Light should be on the plants about 12 to 14 hours a day. Hmm. <laughs> yes? Oh, yeah. Right. Um, yes, lights, most of the time they need to be just about that far above the plant and you can make them go up. I really don't have too much trouble with that, but it could be, that's why some of these things are a little bit leggy. You know, the light needs to be kind of close to the plant so that, otherwise they're reaching for the light and they get pretty long. Uh, doing that, and so they aren't nearly as stable. Um, okay, um, watch your seed packet for any seeds that germinate better in the dark. There are some, especially carrots. They like to be in the dark to germinate. And one person, um, Roots and Refuge, Jessica Soward, I don't know if you watched her, but she, um, for carrots, when she uh, sows them out in the garden, she um, prepares the soil, makes sure it's really fine and everything, puts the carrot seed in, 
waters it down very well, and then covers it with a piece of board. For uh, Carrots take a long time to germinate, so she'll check it after about two weeks. And then, you know, once they're starting to pop up, then she'll take the board out. And it, it does help in, um, speed up the germination. Okay, this I was talking about uh, the rooftop method of potato planting. Uh, what I did was I cut the grass uh, as low as I could, and then I put the um, contractor paper or paper bags, cut paper bags, and um, put those down, um, and then just uh, put four, and this is a four foot bed, I put four potatoes across, and about every uh, foot, I, like I said, <laughs> I put them pretty close together. And then I covered them with about 12 inches of, I used hay. Some people go, you're going to be sorry because that can have hay seed or a lot of weed seed in it. But this was old seed, old hay, you know, that Pete and Joanne had that, and they were trying to get rid of. And I just um, really, you fluff it up, you know, and then just put it about 12, in, at least 12 inches high. And... Um, and covered it up. It takes about an, a month and a half for it to start coming up. And it, it came up even better than that. It just takes a little while for them to start coming up. This is, I would say, kind of a mixed bag of um, how good it works. Um, I got potatoes, and I used them almost half the season. But um, they, um, I had a lot of problems with little... Mole, uh, moles or voles or mice or whatever getting under there and trying to eat part of the potato. Um, but I think I will still try, especially the reason I did this, I was trying to figure out a quick way of getting a garden bed in without that much dirt, you know, I was running out of dirt. So I did it this way. I may do that again this year if I can't get enough dirt going. Um, but like Melody said, it's a whole lot easier digging these potatoes. You pull the hay <laughs> off, you know, and there are your potatoes right there on top of the ground. Of course, the, the um, paper has disintegrated. But... Um, I think uh, it's called Ruth Stout Method, and I think I will try that. I may try it again. Now, Melody is going to be talking about um, propagation of sweet potatoes, which I need to. Oh, and, and by the way, potatoes, I was going to show you. Um, this is how potatoes grow. I had a bag of potatoes that I forgot I had. Look at that. And you know what? Those will grow. You put them in the ground, and they will grow. You cut off some of the shoot? No, don't have to. No. It depends, because if, it, it if, you if you put them deep, they can break off in the soil. But if you do it lightly, they won't break off. Yeah. Sometimes what I do in my storage is I'll, I'll check them periodically, like once a month, when I'm looking to make sure there's nothing spoiled. And if I see that, I'll just knock it off. But then, like a month or so before I'm actually going to want them, I won't knock it off anymore. Right. You know, I like I prefer to plant them like that. Yeah. Because this could always fall off, but these are pretty strong. Right. Pretty but strong I ones. I planted them like this. But under the hay, that would work. Perfect. Yeah, that would work perfect. Yeah. I'm still using dirt, and that's a lot to unearth. Them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> I've thought about this uh, grow bag idea. Yes. Grow bag or even your buckets. Right. Or something like right. that. Right. Go ahead. So I'm with sweet potatoes. All right. So I'm going to need. So um, has anybody here grown sweet potatoes? Yeah. It's, it's a little surprising, isn't it, how you grow them? You don't really grow them the way you grow potatoes. Um, and the reason is, is they're not actually considered a potato. They're considered part of the, um, it, it's the, what's called the, that, what do they call it, the, 
that family. Oh, I don't, I don't know that family that well. Yeah, it's it's a flower actually. Yeah. A morning glory. Morning. That's it. Morning glory. Yeah. So, <coughs> so they actually have to grow from a green, not from. Uh, but but you do grow the green from the potato. So um, there's some different ways of doing it. Um, you you've probably seen people stick them in water. Have you ever seen them do that? Mm -hmm. And I experimented with that, and then I went back to YouTube and discovered that actually dirt works better. So it actually uh, produces faster, and it looks like it's a lot more robust. Um, didn't Oh, good, you do have some of my pictures. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is my experiment when I did it with water. This was a few years ago. And I could not find my pictures when I was doing it with dirt, but it's significantly uh, more. Um, and it took a lot longer. So um, this is what grows from them. And it's good to be patient to let them grow a little bit longer because the way you're going to get them into the water, you've got to take cuttings off of them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to put the, put the end in here, and the water will root them, kind of like tomato uh, sprouts. Have you ever done that? Have you ever rooted tomatoes? You could, from, from the sucker of the tomato, you can cut that mm -hmm. and stick it in water, and it'll root, and then you can have another tomato. Mm -hmm. So you can do that with sweet potatoes as well. So um, anyway, so today I'm going to show you what I do with dirt. But before that, I want to explain a little bit about how to um, do cuttings. So I usually let it grow quite high because it seems like it's a little faster than cutting it, waiting for it to grow, cutting it again. So I'll let it grow. And um, do you see where the leaf node is? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for something that's like four to six inches long. Okay, because you're going to want to put it in a jar of water. And I would choose a jar that I don't mind throwing away later because it kind of, it does get a little dirty. And you do have to refresh the water periodically. And so I just want to toss it when I'm done. So I don't want to use a nice canning jar. <laughs> so anyway, so what I'm going to do is, this is really nice. Um, let's just assume that this is the top leaf instead of continuing to go here. So I'm going to look at this nice section. I'm going to say, oh, where's the next node? Okay, the next node is right here. So I'm going to cut right above that leaf, and then I'm going to put this in water. Hmm. And if it's really congested, let, let's say there's, like it almost looks like there's another node forming here. Um, if it, Let's just say that down here it's really tight and there's a bunch of them. Um, I'll do it right above a node. Let's just say there's a bunch here. And then I'll strip these leaves here mm -hmm. and stick it in. So that it's, you don't want to put the leaves in here because they'll spoil. Um, and the other thing that I actually learned on a YouTube video too, and I've done, I haven't had problems with, um, one thing nice about sweet potatoes is they don't have a lot, they don't really have pests really, mm -hmm. um, and not a lot of diseases. I do know that I think deer or, um, woodchucks will eat the leaves. Mm -hmm. So you saw, I had some, um, some surrounding plastic around. Oh. And I found a lot of animals don't cross that. They don't, it's like they almost don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. And since I live in an area where you can't really see it, it doesn't matter if it doesn't look good. <laughs> it's wonderful because a lot, I get most of my harvest that way. So, um, so when you get down here, uh, an old farmer was saying that you don't want to take, if you ever just take it off um, and put it in here, it's better to take off about half an inch because sometimes diseases can happen here between the potato. And they can be in, this, in the, the system. And so he said to cut off a little bit of this before you stick it in. But that's not a problem up here. Mm -hmm. So um, then, obviously, once you've got... Actually, I've been told that you can plant these without roots, but I think that it makes sense to plant them with roots. I think you're going to have it take a little bit better. And um, so you just keep putting them in until you've got enough and until the ground is ready. And the ground, sweet potatoes like warmth. So the ground has to be, you know, at least 60 degrees. So that's usually going to be like the end of May, the first part of June. Um, and you kind of kind of gauge it. There, you can kind of cheat a little bit. Um, if you put landscape cloth, that black landscape cloth down, if you prep your bed like now, and you put black, whatever you're going to plant, if it's going to be, a, if it's a garden bed that's already been used, um, you just prep whatever you want to do with it, and then you cover it with landscape cloth, and the heat, it'll draw heat to the soil. It'll get nice and warm, and it will actually heat up the soil early so that 
you really are good at the end of May, mm -hmm. beginning of June. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I live in an area where there's a lot of trees around me, so my soil may not get as warm as it, you know, as it would normally. Like mm -hmm. at Martha's place, it would probably get warm sooner. So anyway, that's a nice way to do that. And then um, I always wait for a day when it's um, going to be cloudy pretty much all day. Or if you're not going to have that and you need to get it in sooner, because you don't want these sprouts, you don't want these to go in when it's really sunny out, because they'll wilt. But, you know, they're pretty hardy, so a lot of times they'll survive anyway. But I just like to give them, you know, some help. So um, I'll shade cloth them. Or you don't have to do this. But if it's a cloudy day, you definitely don't have to do that, probably. Um, and then you stick them in, and you just create a little spot. And the, or you can just push them in if you've got really soft soil. And um, I like to have at least two nodes that go into the ground. And because they'll get more off of that with, um, with roots, plus the roots will be down there. I usually just go like this. I take it right against the side. And then I um, push it that way. I know it's got good contact with the soil. And then when I'm done, I water them all in really well. And then I put wood chips over it, aged wood chips. And I like to use wood chips because then I almost don't have to water again. So, um, and it's really nice if you do it just before big rain. So, um, but the wood chips I'll put about that high, aged wood chips on top of the soil. Um, when I'm ready to plant, if I have any wood chips left from the previous year, I just rake them. I amend the soil, whatever I'm going to do, like a nitrogen source, like uh, I might do like um, alfalfa pellets, like for horse feed. You know, and it'll, it'll release over time. Sometimes I'll do a little calcium. Um, and then I, you know, do that. I can rake back some of the wood chips and I'll add some new ones in. And for me, it's worth the extra work because it helps with weeds. And it keeps moisture there. I mean, below the wood chips, about two inches below, it almost always stays moist. And you can tell really uh, quickly if you need to water, too, because you can stick your finger in that far. And if it's damp, you're fine. If not... But I've, I've rarely had to. And, and if you plant these in an area where it, it's more moist in your yard, too, it, regular potatoes like moisture. Yes. So I plant my regular potatoes beside these over here. And then when I take these out, these keep growing until, these can keep growing until frost. So you can, I often will harvest them uh, just before a frost because I like them strong so I can pull them out. But if you wait till after the frost, you can do that too. It's just sometimes they won't. They'll they'll be they'll die, of course, right after the frost. I have, I have had experience of um, planting a whole bunch of sweet potatoes, and when I I um, dug them just after frost, and a lot of them spoiled. Okay, so, so I haven't we, done that. At, yeah. I've heard you can do it, but that's good to know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, um, and then yeah, it's beautiful, they're, they, they're, and they store beautifully, and of course they're so sweet and nice, but there is a secret to being sweet, um, you kind of, you need to, um, they have to go through a process where they're in a warm area and moist area, although I don't really have a way to do that, I don't have like a greenhouse or something like that, so what I've done is I just stick them after I dry, that, like I'll pull them from the garden, stick them on the front porch, let them kind of dry out, but I don't keep them on the front porch overnight because I'm afraid something will go after them. Then I put them in crates um, on newspaper, and you could probably do shelving on newspaper too. Uh, on my main level, of the one of my, the middle level of my house, so it's probably close to 70, 65 to 70. Um, and then they just sit there over time and they'll get sweeter that way. So uh, it does take a while for them to get sweeter. Uh, right, otherwise they're just starchy, yeah. Because if you eat them right away, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> but um, and then I once they've dried out fully, and that and I know they've had at least two to three weeks, I'll take them down to the basement where it's and put them in a dark room stacked on crates. And I used to use my my uh, unused bathroom, so it works really. Good. Close the door. Yeah. Now I'm just going to show you. So Melody's going to show us how to put the um, dirt in and, and um, starting the sweet potatoes in dirt, which, as she said, seems to be the better way of doing it. So 
Where did you put your microphone? I've pre-dampened it. You don't want it soggy? You want it to be good? Yeah, you, you want... Because it's been run out. Where's your sh microphone? Where'd you set it? Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like a sponge that's been wrung out. That kind of moist. There's uh, quite a, a balance between how moist you get it and you, you don't want it to um, make your potato rot either. So I, I just, I'm not going to choose big, huge potatoes from, I'll choose like a medium. And I'm going to try a small and see if that makes any difference. If, it, if small gives me still good results, then I'm not going to waste a good potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're just going to stick it in, and you're going to make it about halfway down and on the side. Now, if it's covered a little bit, that's okay. Now, this is actually needing to be, now I'm going to water it in a little bit. But I'll do that at home so it's mm -hmm. not wet going through on the car. But. And like your, your thing, it doesn't have watering uh, holes to drain in, so you have to be careful. I saw one person say you want at least an inch of dirt underneath them, you know, to kind of hold the water that is sitting, that might be sitting in there, you know. I know that there are some people that just do this in the ground, too. Mm. So, but you'd have to have a, probably it's more in the south where it's warmer. Right. Um, so they'll just put them in the ground and they'll grow them that way and then you take them the way that I did. Mm. So, um, yeah, so when I get home, I'm going to make this, I'm going to get it wetter. And then probably this, well, this year, maybe next year, um, I was thinking about just doing it in a tray like this with holes. And it can be something like, you know, those aluminum roast pans that people get that are yeah. disposable. You could use something like that inside a tray, punch holes through it. It'd be a really inexpensive way, and you didn't even have to keep it. You could throw it away at the end of the year if you wanted to. And with holes in it, you know, you could, you could get the water in, just like we showed you before, you know, and, then just, and it would suck it up, and then it would last longer, mm -hmm. you know, between waterings. Because I often forget watering inside. <laughs> Plants are in danger inside. So that's why I use these kind of things. Sure. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Thank you, Melody. Now, one thing I wanted to do was give you a few resources. This is all on your handout. And um, uh, three of these are some of the uh, YouTube things that I have been watching. Melissa Norris, uh, Jessica Soward, and Jill Reagan. Um, and then Paul Deisinger um, has a seedtime.com. Um, it is a very comprehensive garden journal. Um, it it sh tells how you can, um, how to uh, keep a, gar a calendar, you know, when everything needs to, so you enter each um, crop in or eat each seed packet, you know, each um, variety of tomato or whatever. And um, it tells you when you need to plant it because you enter in your own zone and or your zip code and whatever. It tells you when you need to plant it, um, when you, you need to plant it indoors ahead of time if, you, if it requires it. And then, you know, when... Um, it will be ready for harvest. It, it just has so much information on there. Um, and I'm trying to use it, but of course that takes a little bit of my time since I'm doing this program too. <laughs> but um, it is very interesting to use that. Um, now, our next... Um, we can't cover everything on gardening. Like I said, we've both been gardening a long time, and so we can't give you everything, but we are having another um, thing on gardening next uh, month in April, and we're going to be talking more about um, transplanting things into your garden, and about, um, because that's when you'll be doing it soon after that, and uh, direct seeding into the garden, and 
uh, we'll talk about fertilizers, we'll talk about trellising and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So you'll want to be here. Um, and I forgot my little things like this. I had um, at home the little half flyers. So I, you don't have on your flyer today, unfortunately, you don't have the next... Um, list of things, but um, in May we're going to be doing bread making, and that's going to be the third Sunday of May because of, um, no, that's this month. That's not next month. Uh, if, if you need, we have this month's um, little flyer. If you don't have the list of the future things, most of them are on there if you need that. Um, but anyway, you can see all the things that we're going to be doing. May, like I said, is going to be on the third month because uh, third Sunday of the month because of Memorial Day. I thank you so much for coming. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions that they wrote down? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, that's basically the back to Eden um, method. And so uh, the question is, how do you put together the back to Eden uh, garden? And so what you do is, all you do is um, mow your grass as low as you can. Um, if you have things like thistles in that area, you want to dig those out. But most other weeds you can suppress with the uh, cardboard. And then you will um, get uh, put cardboard down. Cardboard is the easiest. If you use newspaper, you can. I've done that. But you want to put about three or about four thicknesses of newspaper down. Um, and then you cover it with um, about six inches of the compost uh, or the uh, leaf mulch. Um, that's your dirt, okay? And then I do about four to six inches of um, wood chips on it. And um, I'm glad to hear you say, uh, Melody, yeah, wood chips, you have to replenish more often, <laughs> more often than what they say. They say, oh, five years, you know, and I'm going three years and my six inches of wood mulch is, or, or wood, it yeah, is, it's gone. So, um, yeah, that's it. it it's, I would say, too, with the, with the, with a cardboard, okay. With a cardboard, if you wet it first, it will contour better. Yes, and, and it won't it won't steal water from other things as much. Uh, some people have concerns with the cardboard because it has air pockets, you know, because it doesn't completely contour to the ground, and that can allow weeds to get through easier. Mm. Um, but if you wet it, it will help with that. Um, I've heard that too. I just forget. And then, <laughs> and then uh, the compost is really important. But you can kind of, if you start in the fall, you don't actually need the compost because it, the ground will, it, the weeds will be suppressed, and the because um, they'll die yeah. underneath the cardboard, and then you'll have dirt below that, and it'll be gone usually. By so, the so that would be using your own dirt, right? So, because if, you suppress right. the weeds, yeah. Right, and I, you know, you still might want to do it. You could do a little dirt if you wanted to, um, uh, because it doesn't hurt to have healthy compost in there. For because remember, you're feeding the the critters below that, and the more you have, sometimes I've even thrown some of my kitchen scraps mm -hmm. out um, on top of that. But um, if you do it in the fall, but you don't, you don't, you're not going to plant until the spring. Then you actually don't have to use the the As dirt that you're going to plant dirt, into because yeah. you're not going to plant into it till the spring, and then it's already going to be there underneath, mm -hmm. you know, and ready. And hopefully the weeds will be dead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The cardboard and newspaper from molding. Um, the cardboard and newspaper shouldn't mold. No, I, it's okay, actually, under the dirt or in the dirt because you'll get you'll see something like white, and it is a type of mold, but, it, but it's actually more of a 
what is it that the mycelium, mycelium which is super healthy when you see that it actually means your soil is good and also if you see mushrooms it means your soil is doing well it's mm -hmm. not like oh gross knock those out they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and breaking down structures and um, as long as it's in contact with the dirt where the microbes are it should be pretty good because it's going to control the moisture levels. You want to make sure with your cardboard and stuff like that, you want to make sure that it isn't the shiny ones, you know? Right. Just the The paper. colorful, shiny ones, yeah, right. Yeah. And if you want to pull tape off of it, too, first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because that's not going to break down very quickly. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I heard somebody say they had problems with ground, with um, groundhogs, mm -hmm. and just about a week ago, I was talking to somebody and saw a um, groundhog walk right outside my port, and she said, you know how to get rid of them? I said, yes, but she says, a real easy way is take your used cat litter and put it down the hole. She says they'll scat. <laughs> That's true. Um, I've actually I've had them go under my fruit trees and I put it right there and they don't come back. That's great. So, and great other places hear. like around your foundation, I've done that. They yeah. haven't come back. Good. Was it fresh? So, so it, it's kind of a mixed bag, apparently. For some people, it works. Some of those, it doesn't. That's but interesting. It's, it's not hard to use. Try. It's worth well, a try. Well, a friend of mine did that, and she had a female cat. And it helped. But boy, she had a lot of blankets around. <laughs> <laughs> because, ooh, ooh, I'm so much to get married. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. Did you have a question? Oh. I just want to say thank you for helping the community. Uh -huh. Oh, you're welcome. It's our you're pleasure. Welcome. It's fun uh, to get new gardeners going. <laughs> right, right. There's uh, some refreshments out here. Um, if you'd like to have some, and um, if you have other questions you want to ask us personally, that's fine. <laughs> thank you for coming.